not worth it. It takes a muscle to fall in love by saying something stupid like I love you. Love is a stranger in an open car, broken love lawn on your rocks. I'm not a human, I'm a dove. I'm your conscience, I am love. 
je me changerai en or pour que tu m'aimes encore. The love that you need will never be found at home. Love is a game, baby. Want to play? I ain't no vision. I'm the girl who loves you inside and out. Be the temple of your heart. Be the body of your love. All I have is my love of love. And love is not loving. But with all the love I give you, it's never enough. Why does your love hurt so much? Trying to forget my feelings of love. Red, red wine. I loved you right from the start. It wasn't love. It was a perfect illusion. Love can never be exactly like we want it to be. I had a little love. Now I'm back for more. God speed your love tonight. Dedicated to my daughters, old friends with new faces. My nature demands that my life should be perpetual love, wrote dear Lord Beaconsfield to one of his female friends in a moment of spiritual expansion. And Dr. Swift recommended women to turn their attention less to making nets and more to making cages so that there might be fewer unhappy homes. Our mothers were apt to speak with almost brutal frankness about the way to the human heart. And as its topography does not change, it may well be to give closer study to it with a view to entering and entrenching ourselves firmly. This can only be accomplished by persevering and intelligent effort. If then we would have laughter and shining faces at our board, if we would preserve the devotion of our husbands, the enthusiasm of our children, the preference of our friends and the contentment of our domestics. Let us be housekeepers and give more of our best brains to the work. We must put those thoroughbreds, imagination, generosity, invention, into harness with our jaded hacks, custom, thrift and commonplace as they drag along time's hurrying chariot to the often depressing sound of the family gong. It is the old friend greeting us in disguise of a new acquaintance that interests us, the unexpected that stimulates our listless appetite, the getting there by brilliant talk and happy memories. For long industrious years, have you not ordered weekly a roast of mutton? Inevitable, as a mother-in-law, dreary as the weekly washing book, but now rechristen it and having begged the butcher who must not be your enemy, but your friend and ally for especially nice small one, a Welsh leg for choice in compliment to recent additions of our house of Lords, ask your cook to treat it thus. Stick into the thick part of the joint a refined little clove of garlic Cover the bottom of the braising pan into which you have put a walnut sized piece of fresh butter with a liberal allowance of fresh vegetables, onions, carrots, celery, some thyme, parsley and a bay leaf. Lay your gigot in the vegetables and fry quickly and thoroughly, turning the meat constantly so that it may be brown. Then add half a bottle of clary and a dash of brandy if it can be spared with a breakfast cupful of good stock. Let these simmer gently from about four o'clock until dinner time, basting the meat often. Before serving, strain the gravy from the vegetables, remove the clove of garlic and place your gigot on a roomy dish, preferably of brown earthenware. And garnish this, pouring over the gravy immediately after carving it delicately and handing it around very hot, with some browned potatoes and any other vegetables, like such as creamy turnips or braised haricots.
I'd love to have the whole place swimming in roses. God of heaven, there's nothing like nature. The wild mountains and the sea and the waves rushing and the beautiful country with fields of oats and wheat and all kinds of things and all the fine cattle going about, that would do your heart good. To see rivers and lakes and flowers, all sorts of shapes and smells and colours springing up even out of the ditches, primroses and violets nature. It is as for them saying there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't you go and create something? I often ask them, atheists or whatever they call themselves, and wash the cobbles off themselves first, then they go howling for the priest and then dying. And why, why? Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, Yes, I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it at all? Who are they? Don't know neither. Do I so then? <laughs> you are they. Might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said. The day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Hal's head in the grey tweed suit and his straw hat. The day I got him to propose to me. Yes. I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth and it was a leap year like now, yes, 16 years ago, my God, after that long kiss, I nearly lost my breath, yes. He said I was a flower of the mountain, yes. So we are flowers, all a woman's body, yes. That was one true thing he said in his life and the sun shines for you today, yes. That was why I liked him because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is I knew I could always get round him and I gave him all the pleasure I could leading him on till he asked me to say yes and I wouldn't answer first I only looked out over the sea and the sky I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of Mulvey or Mr Stanhope or Hester and father and old Captain Groves and the sailors playing all birds fly I say stoop and washing up the dishes they say it on the here and the sentry in front of the governor's house with the thing round his white helmet poor devil half roasted and the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls and their tail combs and the auctions in the morning the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe Duke Street and the foul market all clacking outside Larby Sharon's and the poor donkeys slipping half asleep from the vague fellows in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps and the big wheels of the carts of the bulls and the old castle thousands of years old yes and those handsome moors all in white and turbans like kings asking you to sit down in that little bit of a shop and ronda with the old windows of the posadas glancing eyes a lattice hid for her lover to kiss the iron and the wine shops half open at night and the castanets and the night we missed the boat at Algeciras, the watchman going about the serene with his lamp and oh that awful deep down torrent, oh the sea, the sea crimson sometimes like fire and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Almeida gardens, yes, and all the queer little secrets in pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and the geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl where I was the flower of the mountain, yes. When I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls I used to wear, shall I wear a red? Yes. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall and I thought well as well him as another and then I asked him with my eyes to ask me again, yes. And then he asked me would I say yes to yes, my mountain flower and first I put a right arms around him. Yes, and I drew him down to me so he could feel my breast all perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and I said, yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. If I have understood the limitations of my speaking in the esoteric but fatal language of clinical control, it is far more difficult to articulate the deadly, blandish moments of the exoteric language of cosmic love. 
This language propagates the paradox and pathos of the Lonely Hearts column in the New York Review of Books. Literati describe themselves with the same cultured and idealizing fantasy that has led them after decades of semi-experience limited by just that fantasy to the desperation of the self-advertisement in those August columns. O oh, violence in love. The injunction which pervades the literature of the alternative healing to become exceptional or edgeless. To assume unconditional love is poor psychology, worse theolo theology and no notion of justice at all. While presenting itself as a post-Judaic New Age Buddha Buddhism, the spirituality re-insinuates the most remorseless protestantism. It burdens the individual soul with an inner predestination. You have eternal life only if you dissolve the difficulty of living, of love, of self and other, of the other in the self. If you are translucid without inner or outer boundaries, if you lead a normally unhappy life, you are predestined to eternal damnation. You will not live. This is the counsel of despair which would keep the mind out of hell. The tradition is far kinder in its understanding that to live, to love, is to be failed, to forgive, to have failed, to be forgiven, forever and ever. Keep the mind in hell and despair not. A crisis or illness, bereavement, separation, natural disaster could be the opportunity to make contact with deeper levels of the terrors of the soul, to lose and to bind, to bind and to lose. A soul which is not bound is as mad as one with cemented boundaries. To grow in lovability is to accept the boundaries of oneself and others while remaining vulnerable, woundable around the bounds. Acknowledgement of conditionality is the only unconditionality of human love. Exceptional, edgeless, lover faces the risks of relation, that mix of exposure and reserve, of revelation. It commands the complete unveiling of the eyes, the transparency of the body. It denies that there is no love without power, that we are at the mercy of others and that we have others in our mercy. Existence is robbed of its weight, its gravity, when it is deprived of its agon. Instead of insinuating that illness may better prepare you for the earthly impossibilities, these, faith, hope, and love, would condemn you to seek blissful, deathless, cosmic emptiness, the repose without the reveal. I reach for my favorite whiskey bottle and instruct well-wishers to imbibe the shark's oil and the aloe vera themselves. If I am to stay alive, I am bound to continue to get love wrong all the time, but not to cease wooing, for that is my life affair. Love's work. Where the posthumous fate of dropouts is concerned, love can make all the difference because the way individuals remember each other, if at all, determines much of what makes it onto historical record. Flesh and matter, I tremble, but my cost lifer. Oh, sweet lifer, I tremble, but my cost does not. Oh, sweet lifer, ripe with flesh and matter, I tremble, but my cost does not. Give me an M! <laughs> Give me an A! <laughs> Give me a G!
In Berlin, I went to school. I painted, I skated, I adored gay uniforms. I thought they contained super forms. They, they, though they did not quite conform, though my beauty norm, the Belverde Polo. My attitude is one of love. It is all adoration for all the fringes, all the color, all tinsel creation. My cousin, the rabbit has a queer habit. When asked why she, why have it? She says, damn it. Sweet little Miss Mouse wanted her own house. So she married Mr. Mole and only got a hole. <laughs> Hi, my love. Hello. How are you? <laughs> that was very beautiful. Um, I wanted to say, and this brings me back to Eva, your daughter, I wanted to talk about my favourite, most comforting item of clothing, which was given to me by, well, your, by your sister, actually, outside of the new theatre on something strat. Um, and it was quite a beautiful way to fall in love, as it were. <laughs> but you met Evie before you met me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about this. I remember like living in Berlin and being in, with these people and then meeting this kid and having this realization <laughs> <laughs> that I have so much more fun with her. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we were making Scooby Doo's together, and and then she cast me in a story as the wicked step sister in Cinderella, and she stole my boyfriend off me on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who did you last say I love you to? You, babe. I also said it's my mother. Every time we have a face off, which is pretty much every day, I uh, we we <laughs> we cover ourselves in I love you, each other. Sorry. Um, wait, I'm meant to be interviewing you, babes. I I have one very important pressing question for you, and it's is love a continuous stream? Well, yes, but it does dry up sometimes. <laughs> but the path is still there where the water once ran. I guess I also see it maybe more as a waterfall. As much as a continuous stream. Sometimes they turn into rivers. So yes. Sometimes they turn into hate also, but that can still be a form of love. Yeah. The flame is, the flame, <laughs> the flame is all, always alive. Um, my my favourite love advice was given to me by Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> You're going to say me. <laughs> um, uh, but she actually got it from Maya Angelou, a slightly more culturally, culturally astute. And it's uh, when somebody shows you who they are, listen. I, I was wondering what your ultimate love advice is, Juliet. To keep loving unconditionally. But also to listen. People will tell you who they are very quickly. <laughs> But I suppose you have to keep loving. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's nothing we can't love, is it? <laughs> oh, there are some things. 
<laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> so back to the Exhibitione, um, which you did with Dorothy Iannone, who is our favourite lady since a long time. Um, and she uses a lot of the uh, themes of the love story she had with this German guy um, a lot. Yeah. And <laughs> well, I suppose it's the everydayness of what that love is, is definitely what her tarot cards mm. display. And also, I suppose, what I'm interested in through my own way of making work, which definitely includes lots of things that I love. What was your favorite tarot card? Justice. Also being a Libra, but that justice does happen. I think it's called different things in different decks. Yeah. What's it called in this one? The Rider Waite? Justice, I think. But this is made by Pamela uh, Cohen Smith. Right. Could it be strength? Can also be strength. Strength with the uh, infinity and the lion. That can also be force, which I don't think you need so much in love. No. Hopefully. Um, Another exhibition that you did that I'm obsessed with is called Femme Maison. And I was wondering why you decided to title your exhibition with that title. It was after the Louise Bourgeois paintings, um, but also because of the nature of the relationship through a mother and a child that were photographs in that exhibition. But the Femme Maison series that Louise Bourgeois made in 1947 has these images of the female body with a house on the head, on like the top half of the body. And she was living in New York at that time and she was bringing up her children, but it's very, the way the painting is, and I think Kirsty Bell has also spoken about this, is that you can't tell if the house imprisons her or if the house is protecting her. Or if the body is a house. Or if the body is a house. And I think also ultimately through that exhibition, I was thinking a lot if how much or how things reverse that the mother needs the love of the child maybe more than the child needs the love of the mother in the end. Mm. My friend Mia, our friend Mia, who might be here, said you give birth to your healer. <laughs> um, what role does love play in your work? In my, I, I, I <laughs> um, sort of an enormous one, I would say. I would say it's the most sort of uh, provocative theme. I mean, not, I mean, love as a sort of, as a stream and as a flame that never turns off. I think a sort of domestic love of comfort will stultify <laughs> the work. But like, I think, I think the turmoil of love, the problems of love, if they are sublimated and transfigured, they will, they are the best juice <laughs> to me. <laughs> Need of love. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, we're gonna make this about withdrawal, I forgot. Withdrawal turned into love. 
um, as it always does. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's a nice place to end. Yeah. Shall we roll the credits? <laughs> Oh, not that one. I love you. I love you extra more. <laughs>